Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from F. Hoffman LaRoche Limited. Hello, my name is Federico Capuzzo. I'm the Director of Medical Oncology at the National Cancer Institute Regina Elena in Rome, Italy. It's really a great pleasure today to discuss with you the overview of the different systemic treatment delivery methods for patients specifically with lung cancer. So the uh, rationale for uh, uh, exploring the different methodology that we can use today for uh, delivering uh, uh, drugs uh, is extremely important because uh, we have today the opportunity to improve uh, the experience uh, of the patient uh, in, the, in the clinic by reducing the time they have to spend in the hospital. And also we can optimize uh, the resource uh, of the hospital today our hospitals are really crowded by patients. We need to reduce the access of patients in the hospital. We need to facilitate also the patient to receive a therapy, even when they have difficulties in going to the hospital. Not all patients with cancer are the same. They can have a lot of difficulties related to the disease or even related to the healthcare, to the, the caregiver they have. So the, today, uh, using uh, also an alternative way of administration compared to the standard intravenous approach is extremely important. We have also the possibility of using different agents orally. Uh, many target therapies to, today are orally available. But also we have the possibility today of using subcutaneous uh, uh, drugs we have new agents available, including immunotherapy. It's much more easy to deliver this agent subcutaneously. We have clinical trials demonstrating that the patient prefer this, uh, this approach. And this approach also allows the patient to, to reduce uh, the activity, to reduce the cost. Also, the timing for preparing the drug in the hospital and also for delivering the drug to the patient is quicker. And certainly, this is an advantage for all the health, for all the health system. So in this uh, program, we have uh, different uh, uh, presentations and we will show also the data we have uh, uh, available uh, today and uh, um, explaining why uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, administration of this agent uh, is uh, globally much more convenient. Hello, my name is uh, Federico Capuzzo. I'm the Director of Medical Oncology at the National Cancer Institute uh, Regina Elena in Rome, uh, Italy. And really is a great pleasure to discuss today about uh, uh, subcutaneous therapy, specifically in patients with lung cancer. So the usage of different uh, uh, agents subcutaneously in cancer in general is not uh, something that we are doing uh, uh, only recently because uh, we have also different uh, drugs in oncology that were already used subcutaneously uh, many years ago. Uh, we have drugs that were given even during the 60s in, in patients with cancer. The main difference uh, compared to the past is that in the past, uh, the drugs were given using a limited volume, meaning less than three millimeter, uh, milliliters. While uh, today, with the agents we are using today, we increase the volume of the infusion. We, we are infusing more than 10 milliliters. And uh, this is also the reason why we have uh, uh, some uh, precaution uh, uh, that we need uh, to adopt. Uh, and of course, we have some advantage. In general, by using the subcutaneous injection, the great advantage is the reduction in the pharmacy preparation time and cost. Also, we have a reduction in chair time and we have an increased adherence to long-term therapies. 
One of the points uh, in terms of precaution, one of the most important point is where we should infuse uh, the, uh, the, the drug, because uh, theoretically we can infuse uh, in any place subcutaneously, but the abdomen certainly is the most, uh, is the, the site where we prefer to infuse uh, this agent. Because uh, as you can see in this slide, we don't have uh, any significant difference in the uh, thickness in the abdomen between male and female. But the most important point is the pain, because uh, by infusing the drug in the abdomen, the risk of pain is lower compared to other anatomical sites. Also, another important point is uh, how can we infuse uh, the drug, because it is strongly recommended to, uh, to inject the drug very slowly. This is uh, because we need to reduce the, one of the most important uh, adverse events that we can have, that is pain. So with a slow injection, we have um, a vertical distribution of the drug, while with uh, uh, a faster injection, we have uh, an horizontal spread of the medications resulting in increased pain. So it's important also to reduce uh, the risk of uh, this uh, important, uh, uh, potentially important uh, adverse event. So many agents uh, has been uh, um, tested, has, has been evaluated in clinical trials in, uh, in lung cancer. I'll focus my presentation on three agents, specifically on atezolizumab, amivantamab and nivolumab. And I'll present you some of the data we have today available with these three agents. I want to start with atezolizumab and with the IMSHIN001 trial that was a randomized trial comparing atezolizumab subcutaneous versus intravenous in immunotherapy naive patients progressing after platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. The primary endpoint of this trial was a pharmacokinetic, and the secondary endpoint included, of course, the efficacy of the treatment. Well, when we consider, when we look at the efficacy parameter, there is no difference in efficacy between the two formulations. The median PFS was virtually identical with, in, with intravenous and subcutaneous, also, no difference in terms of response rate uh, has been observed. No difference in terms of safety between the two administration ways. Uh, and again, uh, importantly, also the pharmacokinetic was comparable. So this trial led to another important trial, the IMSHIN002 trial that was presented uh, very recently during the European Lung Cancer Conference in Prague. This trial was a phase two open label study comparing atezolizumab subcutaneous versus intravenous in no small cell lung cancer patients with resected stage two to three B uh, no small cell lung cancer completing adjuvant chemotherapy and PDL1 positive, any level of PDL1 positivity, or patients with stage four chemotherapy naive with high levels of PDL1, so more than 50%. So patients were randomized to receive atezolizumab subcutaneous or intravenous for three cycles. At the end of these three cycles, patients were switched over the alternative uh, uh, route of administration for additional three cycles. And at the end of these uh, six cycles, patients uh, uh, gave their choice on uh, the usage of the drug subcutaneously or intravenous during the continuation period. When we look at the results in terms of the primary endpoint, the primary endpoint, so the patient preference, uh, the, the, uh, the majority of patients, more than 70% of patients prefer the subcutaneous uh, um, administration. And as a consequence, the secondary endpoint also was in favor of the subcutaneous usage of the drug during the continuation period. When we look also to the satisfaction of the patient, patients were satisfied of atezolizumab irrespective of the way in which the drug was given with a numerical uh, uh, preference for uh, the subcutaneous usage. Also, when uh, in this trial, it uh, uh, was possible also to analyze uh, some uh, uh, important advantage that we can have with the uh, subcutaneous usage because uh, uh, atezolizumab subcutaneous uh, doesn't need to be prepared in a sterile condition and also can be prepared out uh, on the world. 
and also the preparation time for atezolizumab subcutaneous was much more quicker, three times quicker, uh, when prepared by nurses on the world compared with the pharmacist in the pharmacy. Also, importantly, no safety concern emerged. So uh, there is uh, the, uh, the no unexpected toxicity was observed and the uh, treatment was uh, very well tolerated regardless of the sequence. The other agent uh, that has been also investigated in the subcutaneous formulation is amivantamab. Amivantamab is uh, a bispecific antibody against EGFR and MET and at the present, amibantamab is approved in patients uh, with uh, exon 20 insertion uh, uh, progressing uh, on or after platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. One of the most relevant problems that we have in the clinic with amibantamab is the risk of infusional reactions. That is uh, something occurring in more than 60% of patients. So in order to reduce the risk of, a, of a, a infusional reaction, um, was uh, uh, developed this uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, formulation. And uh, specifically, the PALOMA trial was a phase 1b study uh, assessing particularly feasibility, safety, uh, pharmacokinetic, uh, and the risk, of course, of uh, infusion reaction between the subcutaneous and the intravenous uh, uh, amivantamab. When uh, we look at the results uh, in terms of uh, pharmacokinetic, uh, the pharmacokinetic was uh, virtually identical, so no significant difference were observed between uh, subcutaneous or the intravenous administration of the drug. And also in terms of safety, the general safety uh, profile was identical between uh, the uh, intravenous and the subcutaneous. The most relevant and critical difference was, of course, represented by the risk of infusional reaction that was uh, much uh, lower in the uh, group of patients that were assigned to the subcutaneous amibantamab. Uh, infusional reaction occurred in uh, uh, approximately 16% of patients uh, using the subcutaneous versus more than 60%, that is exactly what we expected when amibantamab was used intravenously. The third agent uh, that is uh, at the present time was investigated also uh, in a, a subcutaneous formulation was nivolumab. What I'm presenting you are uh, in uh, the data from a clinical trial assessing uh, um, randomizing patients with uh, a metastatic or advanced renal cell carcinoma to nivolumab subcutaneous or nivolumab intravenous. Again, the primary point was uh, the pharmacokinetic uh, and also the response rate was uh, among the secondary endpoint. Well, when we look again to the results, the, um, the, we can see that there is uh, no difference uh, uh, between uh, the two uh, the way in which we can give the drug. And of course, the uh, timing for giving the drug was uh, reduced by using nivolumab subcutaneously. In terms of pharmacokinetic, uh, the non-inferiority for the uh, co-primary pharmacokinetic endpoints was uh, met. So we have uh, the pharmacokinetic was not negatively impacted with using the subcutaneous usage. And in terms of efficacy, again, there is uh, no difference in terms of efficacy. Here we can see the data in terms of response rate and no difference in terms of response rate was observed in this study. And uh, specifically, when we look also to additional endpoint, including uh, uh, disease control rate, including uh, median progression-free survival, you can see that there is uh, no difference between the two formulations. Uh, specifically, in terms of progression-free survival, we can see that the curves are, uh, are um, uh, absolutely identical with the two uh, ways, with the two administration ways of uh, this uh, specific agent. And also importantly, in, again, in uh, terms of safety, there is no difference, no, no unexpected toxicity, and the toxicity profile was exactly what we expected with no difference between subcutaneous and intravenous usage of the agent. So in conclusion, the overall patients prefer subcutaneous versus intravenous, and patients are satisfied with the subcutaneous uh, administration, 
the primary endpoint of all clinical trials so far conducted, so the IMSH 001 and 002, the Paloma, the Checkmate 67T, were met, and uh, subcutaneous has uh, the potential for hospital resources to be used uh, more efficiently when locally uh, registration allows uh, out of pharmacy preparation. This is a very important point. And the overall safety profile was consistent with a well-established intravenous profile without any safety concern. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here and discuss this important topic. I am Shani Shilo, founder of the Israeli Lung Cancer Foundation. And my husband had lung cancer and was living with lung cancer for 11 years. So we know that in the past decade, tremendous developments happened with uh, lung cancer and a lot of treatments were developed. But we know that when there is personalized treatment, the patient and the caregiver will accept any, any treatment available that will be offered. Also, until lately, there were only two ways of delivering lung cancer drugs orally, which are the biologics against mutations, or by IV administration with all the immunotherapies. Now, we know that with the lung cancer patients who are on biological treatments, who use them orally, they take the pills at home at a, at a specific time every day. And compared to that, the patients who get the drugs and the treatments through IV, they get it usually in a hospital setting. So let's first hear a perspective from a person who is living with lung cancer. Hello, everyone. My name is Yossi Shamash. I'm 55 years old, and I was diagnosed with lung cancer in July 2016, stage 4 C-mate mutation. I underwent several chemotherapy, biological, and immunotherapy treatments. The tumor and metastasis almost disappeared, and I went into emergency surgery, where they removed an upper lab plus two ribs, then radiation and continued treatment with nivolumab until today. I have been disease-free for seven years. While receiving the chemotherapy treatments, I had mild side effects, such as pain, exhaustion, hair loss, and more. In contrast, the side effects in immunotherapy are much milder, mostly exhaustion. The whole process of getting to the hospital uh, for treatment is quite stressful, requires an escort, and lasts about half a day. In terms of the decision-making process regarding the treatments, we were uh, partners all the way along with the doctor. We did as he said, and it worked. The diagnosis turned my life upside down. From a healthy and strong person, I became terminally ill within a day. I experienced deep depression. I became a sad person, depending on the environment, anxious and physically very weak. Life with cancer is full of anxieties about tomorrow. Basically, I live from one CT scan to next one. The best advice I can give is always be surrounded by loving family and friends. Do things that make you happy and live the day. For me, it was also done with the help of physiological therapy and pills. So when we look at the patient's perspectives on being treated with systemic therapies for lung cancer, and we think what has changed in the past decade, so we know that there is increased survival, and that means that people live for many years living with lung cancer. This is a prolonged journey, and in this journey, uh, it may be that they will be treated with a few lines of treatments, every time going ups and downs when the disease is stable, and then again when there's progression of the disease. We also know that this decade has been different because we have internet and we have social media. 
and we have a lot of uh, differences in communication because the patient now can Google things, can learn things. And when I mean the patient, I mean the patient and the caregiver, the main caregiver who really uh, accompanies the patient at all the journey. So all of these uh, actually uh, affect the quality of life of the patients. And in this uh, quality of life survey done by the NHS, they they looked at what is quality of life for patients and a few things have to be uh, thought of when we think of quality of life and that's the mobility of the patient, the anxiety and stress before treatments, before scans, before coming to the hospital, doing everyday tasks, um, dealing with symptoms, symptoms of the disease. And again, the disease is now prolonged. People live for many years with lung cancer. So there are more and more symptoms that we need to address and more and more side effects from the treatments themselves and their overall health and friends and relationships. So we need to really take a better care of the quality of life of the patient. And when we uh, better the quality of life of the patient, we will also better the quality of life of the caregiver. So if we look at what can happen if we compare drug delivery, when we compare IV delivery to a new option that is injection, a subcutane injection. So with IV administration of drugs, especially immunotherapies, we know that the pros, that it's very established and you come to the hospital, which is a con usually, the, the, the good thing about it is when you come to the hospital, you get to see an HCP, not always your oncologist, but, but you'll get to see the nurse and you can discuss things and raise things. So that's, that's a, a pro. But uh, in terms of cons, coming to the hospital and spending a few hours, opening a vein, you know, only people that go through treatments every month, twice a month, every time opening a vein, you know, you get connected to your special nurse who can find your vein. So this is a big thing. Also the time consuming for caregiver and the cost because the caregiver has to spend a few hours with the patient. So these are the cons of IV, but if we think of giving a drug instead of IV by a subcutane injection, then this is something that will definitely save time. There is less fear of opening a vein. Uh, in the future, it may be also not in the hospital, but maybe in the community or at home. And the thing is that today it is still less established. So let's look a bit on what's out there. You know, what do we know till now? And in an interesting study where they compared a, an intravenous administration versus subcutane drug administration, and what did, did the patients prefer? And what they saw there, uh, and this was an article uh, by Stoner et al., is that actually the patients prefer subcutane administration versus IV administration. In another study where we are now looking at autoimmune diseases, because in lung cancer, this is very new, the option of different ways of the drug administration. So let's try and learn from other disease areas. And in autoimmune diseases, you get with many biological drugs, the option to get it either by IV administration or by a subcutane injection. So this is a study where they looked at uh, IBD and they wanted to hear of the patient's uh, perspective. And what they sh show is uh, that 25% of people wanted to choose the way of administration of the drug. It was important for them to make the choice. Another uh, important uh, uh, result from this study was that all of the people felt more comfortable with getting their injections instead of IV, wishing to minimize the time of transportation and treatment and doing it also at home and by themselves. 
If we try to learn also from cancers where these ways of, of delivering treatments were developed, you know, uh, before lung cancer, and this article is speaking about lymphoma patients, and this is important because they assess the transition from being treated with an IV treatment and moving the just the delivery away from IV to subcutane. And they check the different benefits, including what did the patient think. And what they showed is that for the patients moving to a subcutane injection, it was so much uh, less time consuming in compared to the IV treatment. So it was for getting IV treatment, it took more time for the patient and the caregiver to be at the hospital. And this is very uh, important. So what we see here is that uh, another thing which is important, also what we said in terms of social media, is what about the communication? Because this is something that maybe the, the patient and the caregiver and the doctor should discuss together. And we are speaking about shared decision making. And what we saw from this article, and this was done by the uh, Bonnie Adario Lung Cancer uh, Foundation, a very well-known patient organization. And what they showed is that 75% 70 of patients wanted to be involved in making the the difficult decision with shared decision making and also what it showed there that patients wanted the hcps to be transparent so they can discuss and discuss you know with transparency the good things and the bad things of transitioning let's say from an iv uh, way of delivery to a subcutane and we need to manage these expectations between choosing IV and subcutane treatments. And this is where the lung cancer treatments are going to. And what we need to do is to educate patients, discuss the treatment goals, explain administration processes, highlight benefits and limitations, address side effects, really have supporting resources and encourage open communication. So to summarize, in lung cancer, where the scenario of lung cancer has been changed so much for the good with more and more treatments, adding drug delivery, a way of administration such as subcutane instead of IV is a very important uh, development for lung cancer, which can be more convenient, time-saving, improve quality of life, reduce anxiety, and of course, we need to have everything very open and transparent and with a shared decision with the patient when there are options. Thank you. Hello, I'm Federico Capuzzo from the uh, National Cancer Institute of Regina Elena in Rome, Italy. And uh, welcome to this uh, segment. Uh, the title of this segment is uh, Sharing Clinician Perspectives. And uh, we have uh, uh, questions with uh, 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 Alba Silverio from uh, uh, Barcelona. Alba, welcome to this uh, segment. Hello, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> So these are what we will discuss today in this specific segment. So we will discuss the key difference between uh, intravenous and subcutaneous administration. How my subcutaneous administration positively impact patients and the practical guidance for patients and clinicians with regard to maintaining patient safety, monitoring toxicity and ensuring adherence. So my uh, first question to uh, Alba is uh, to uh, share case studies around lung cancer uh, therapy administration. So Alba. Yes, well, um, when patients are diagnosed with lung cancer, um, I think that they start a long journey and it's essential that a good connection is formed between the healthcare um, team, the nurse, the doctor, and the team, and the patient and the caregiver. So, I think it's very important before the patient starts treatment that in the visit with the doctor, they can decide um, what kind of treatment they are going to receive. So they are very informed and they can take part of this decision. So in the case that there are treatments that are available in different 
um, formulations. For example, IV and SATCAT, I think that it's very important that the patient takes part in this decision. Um, so, for example, in, in, in medications that there are available both in IV and SATCAT, for example, uh, for the IV administrations, we have patients that they prefer this, this way of administration because um, they, maybe they are they have a good vein, so they don't mind uh, us putting a cannula in for the IV administration. And maybe they consider that the subcut administrations are painful, so they think that they, they, this way of administration is better. Um, and in the other way, um, for the subcut administrations, we have lots of patients, that, um, even more patients that are very young, um, that they are diagnosed with lung cancer, and they are, are very active, they are still working, and they prefer to have a short uh, treatment, so I think that the best option for them is the subcut. So I think that this decision is very important to be made in the visit with the doctor, and I think if you have a bit of a So uh, for the patients, I think that if they take part in this decision, depending on their health care status and their way of, of, of lifestyle, they, they would keep a better adherence on the treatment if they take part in this decision. Yes, I think this is uh, extremely uh, interesting, uh, Alba. And uh, so my second question for you is, uh, in uh, your opinion, uh, what are the key differences between uh, intravenous uh, and uh, subcutaneous uh, administration? I think this is a very important point because, of course, also the adherence to the treatment uh, is uh, strictly dependent uh, on the difference that we have uh, between these two ways of administration. So what is your opinion on that? Yes, so there are many advantages, both for IV and the subcut administrations. Uh, for example, for the, one of the main advantages of the intravenous administration is that most cancer medicines are available in this formulation. So unfortunately, not, not all of the treatments for lung cancer are available in the subcut uh, formulation. So one, it's one of the greatest advantages of the IV. Another advantage is that when you put a cannula in, uh, in, the vein, in the arm of the patient, more than one medication can be administered via this way. Um, in, in this subcut, you cannot administer more than one medication at a time. Um, and with the IV administration, even it takes longer um, while it's being administered because you just program the infusion pump and start the administration. The nurse can perform other assessments while, while this uh, medication is being administered. In the other hand, for the subcut uh, formulation, there are a lot of advantages too. So for example, it's uh, much more simple and short to administer. It takes less time to prepare and to administer than the IV administration, so the patient stays less time at the hospital. It also reduces the healthcare cost because we don't use as much material as the one that we use uh, in the IV administration. So it can be more convenient for, for patients. And also in the future, I think it, it's very potential to, to be administered at home because it's easy and, 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 and quick to administer. So I think it can be a good, a good option for the future for the patients. And also a good point is that the nurse is present through all the administration because with the IV, you just program the pump and go do other things. But with this you have to be there with the patient, so it's the perfect time to chat with the patient and, and see how, how he's doing and everything. Okay, so certainly we have uh, several uh, um, advantages uh, for uh, the subcutaneous uh, usage. Uh, so at the end, we can say that it's uh, really much more convenient for both, for the patient and for the hospital. So how might subcutaneous administration positively impact patients? So, as I said, um, the fact that this is a shorter treatment and a simpler administration means that the patient will stay much more less time in the hospital than, than with the IV. So, for example, with the IV treatment, the patient may stay for an hour or half an hour, um, an, an hour and a half. And with the subcut, the patient may stay for 20 minutes, maybe. So it's much more shorter for them. So it generates generates less discomfort on the patients because we don't have to look for a vein to administer the treatment because obviously it's given subcut. So it's much more easier both for the patient and, and, and for the nurse um, because we don't have to stay time, to take, time, take time to look for a vein. Um, it reduces the, the chance of, of infection or infusion-related reactions as well. So it's a good point for, 
for the patient. So yeah, I think, uh, and the fact that it can be uh, in the future, I think it's a potential for, for a booster at home. I think that's the, one of the best um, advantages of this, of this formulation. Yes, absolutely. This is a very important advantage. So I just uh, want to ask you an additional clarification on that, on this point specifically, because uh, do you think that in perspective, uh, this approach uh, could also give the possibility of uh, using uh, the subcutaneous uh, administration, for example, for uh, avoiding that the patient go to the hospital? So allowing the patient to receive uh, the therapy really outside of the hospital. I, I think we have to work a lot to to, to, yeah. to get that, but I think that's, that's a good point. I, think, I mean, I, I've done some administrations at home, not for cancer treatments, but for other uh, kind of treatments. And I think that if, um, if there's no risk for the patient, I think that it's very feasible that this kind of treatment is administered at home, yes. Excellent. So another question I have for you, Alba, is how my subcutaneous administration positively impact the clinic and the healthcare system? This is something I already introduced me with my previous question. So what is your opinion on that? Yeah, so going in the same line, um, the fact that the patients stay less time in the hospital, that means that there are more chairs and more beds available for other patients that might be in poorer conditions or that may have longer cancer treatments. Uh, so that's very, very beneficial for the other patients. Also less fungible material is needed, so that reduces hospital costs as well. Um, for the patient and the nurse, I think that it gives us a lot of quality time between us because we have to stay with the patient while we are administering this subcut treatment. So this gives, gives us the opportunity to chat with the patient. And I think that's very beneficial for us. Um, so yeah, I think that one of the most important ones is that um, there will be more chairs available um, for other patients and, and, and for patients that, that are in poorer conditions. That, that's one of the main ones from my, for my perspective. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that particularly the fact that the nurse is present uh, through the uh, administration, uh, uh, so spending more uh, you define quality time uh, with the patient is uh, extremely important also for the compliance to the treatment for the adherence to the treatment but also in general for the really for the quality of life also for the patient and also for the uh, for the uh, for the health care uh, the uh, additional question i have for you is uh, what practical guidance uh, would you give uh, in uh, transitioning from intravenous to subcutaneous delivery well, I think it can be a bit challenging because I think that it's very important that we maintain the patient's safety uh, as well as we, we have to be able to monitor all the toxicities and to ensure the adherence to treatment. So I think that before this transition, um, all the healthcare team has to be very well trained, both the doctor and the nurses, so before the first administration, so the patient knows exactly how is it going to work. Um, for the nurses, we need to train them because it's a, it's a different technique um, we have to train them on the kind of viscosity of the product that they are going to administer because it might be easier or, the, or more difficult depending on the product. The depth of the administration because it's subcut, so it goes along with the, with the technique. Um, they have to know that there's going to be a, a maybe a lamp appearing under the skin because it's given subcut, so depending on the volume uh, that's going to happen. Um, so I think it's very important that we train very well all the, all the healthcare team. Um, because this way they will be able to communicate that to the patient. And that's another good point that we, we have to follow, that, that there must be a good communication with the patient and the caregiver of the family. Um, so we have to let them know what to expect, how it's going to be administered, etc. And as I said before, I think that's another point that's very important. It's that the patients decide alongside with the doctor what treatment administration is more suitable for them depending on their healthcare status, the preferences, and the lifestyle routine, they might prefer the subcut of the IV. So I think that giving the patient the opportunity to, make, to take part in this decision will, will ensure a better adherence to the treatment for the patients. Yes, I think these are all very important points, particularly the uh, training uh, of uh, the nurses is extremely important also for optimizing this uh, uh, relatively new approach uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, subcutaneous usage. So uh, the, in uh, conclusion, so we can uh, certainly say that the, in, the subcutaneous uh, usage of uh, um, the new agents that we have available in uh, lung cancer, particularly immunotherapy, represent an innovative way in which we can deliver easily the drug, we can reduce the timing of patients staying in the hospital, we can facilitate all the activities of the hospital, we can also allow patients to be treated at home, we can certainly contribute significantly in improving the quality of life of both the doctors, nurses, all people working in the hospital and of course improving uh, the quality of life uh, of, uh, of our, uh, our patients. It's a, a very um, a easy way in which we can deliver the drug. The preference for the patient is uh, clearly in favor of subcutaneous usage, and uh, this approach uh, is certainly something that is uh, facilitating the usage of uh, all the new agents in lung cancer. Hello, my name is Federico Capuzzo. I'm the Director of Medical Oncology at the National Cancer Institute, Regina Elena in Rome, Italy. And I just want to summarize the content of this program. So in Chapter 1, I, give, I gave a very quick overview of the different systemic treatment delivery methods in lung cancer. Then uh, in the chapter two, I described specifically all the clinical trials that today we have, uh, particularly in patients with lung cancer, but not only and not uh, also in other diseases. And uh, in uh, this chapter, I highlight uh, how patients prefer the subcutaneous uh, administration uh, of uh, uh, new agents, particularly immunotherapy. Then in chapter three, we had uh, Shani Shilo presenting, sharing uh, also the patient perspective. And in uh, chapter four, we had uh, a very productive discussion together with uh, Alba Silverio, uh, sharing uh, the clinician perspective and giving also highlighting uh, the uh, advantage that we have specifically with uh, the uh, uh, subcutaneous administration of these uh, new agents. Finally, here in uh, chapter five, my key take home message certainly is that today we have a new approach for uh, drug delivery that is uh, subcutaneous, is uh, uh, an innovative way in which we can uh, deliver particularly immunotherapy to patients uh, with cancer, including patients with lung cancer, this method is certainly preferred by the patient, is much more convenient for the hospital and for the whole health system. So this approach certainly is changing the way in which we can approach this kind of therapy and also represent an important way in which we can facilitate and improve the quality of life of our patients. And thank you for uh, participating in this activity. And uh, please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation.